have a few more people coming in. Uh, but welcome to the North Texas Gaming Symposium. I'm Jason Helms. I'm the director of the Center for Digital Expression, and I teach in the English department here at TCU. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you all here. Most of you may not know, but a year ago, we came within about a week of running this symposium before the pandemic shut everything down. So we have been waiting for this moment for a while. In a moment, I'll let our dean give you an overview of the symposium, but first I wanted to read our land acknowledgement. This ancient land for all our relations. We respectfully acknowledge all Native American peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial. TCU especially acknowledges and pays respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose historical mm -hmm. homeland our university is located. TCU has benefited from the dispossession of Native mm -hmm. American peoples. The land on which TCU is located was taken from the Wichita and others through the combined efforts of Spain, France, Mexico, Texas, and the United States. TCU eventually gained possession of it through a system instituted by Texas and the United States that depended on dispossessing and removing the Wichita and others. Thank you all again for joining us today. Uh, now some words of welcome for our dean, from our dean. I will try to get my share screen going again. Hello, I'm Sanja Watson, Dean of the Ad Rand College of Liberal Arts at Texas Christian University. Welcome. We are excited to come together to discuss topics related to gaming and diversity. Each Saturday will include a keynote, roundtable, and interactive workshop or gaming session. This symposium is for faculty from the DFW area, but also outside of it. It's for TCU students and for the public. It's for those who study games, those who make games, those who play them, and those who wander between all these roles. This symposium was partially funded by an instructional development grant at TCU with the goal of connecting game study scholars from across the Metroplex. Our hope is that these connections can lead to working groups that lead to future grants and initiatives. DFW has so many resources in game studies, but so many of us are siloed off in our home institutions. By coming together, we can create one of the most vibrant and innovative game studies groups in the nation. Have a wonderful symposium. Thank you, Dean Watson. Uh, today, we've got an exciting schedule. We'll start with our first keynote address from Johansson Quijano. Uh, this afternoon, we'll have a round table of experts talking about video game pedagogy. And later, Gabby Karoloff and I will run a twine workshop. I would advertise it, but it's full. Uh, so I hope to see those of you who signed up there. The full schedule can be found at noquarters.tcu.edu. We've tried to set up some time for breaks in between, but feel free to come and go as you like. The Zoom link you received should work for the main events and the evening workshops will each have their own separate links that you'll receive if you registered for them. If you haven't yet, please join our Discord. You should have received an email with a link to that. I want to also take a moment to thank those people and organizations who made this possible. The symposium was funded by an institutional development grant at TCU with funds matched by the Center for Digital Expression and the English Department. This event was organized by faculty and staff from across our campus. Sean Atkinson, Nick Bontrager, and Will, got Will Gibbons uh, from the College of Art. Brad Trussell from the library, Gabby Kirilov and myself from English, and recently Wendy Sierra from the Honors College who was not yet an employee of TCU when we asked her to do our keynote. So thank you all. Without further ado then, please welcome Gabby Kirilov to introduce our first keynote speaker. Thanks, Jason. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. We're super excited to finally get this event, this much awaited event underway. Um, we're so pleased to have um, Dr. Johansson Quijano with us this morning. Um, Dr. Quijano is an associate professor of English at Tarrant County College, where he teaches courses on writing, rhetoric, literature, critical thinking, writing in games, and social media. Dr. Quijano earned a PhD in rhetoric from the University of Texas at Arlington, where he also lectures on rhetoric and technical communication. He also holds two graduate degrees from the University of Puerto Rico in both English literature and in education with a focus on linguistics and language acquisition. He has published a number of articles and chapters on gaming theory and criticism, ed tech, and ludic narratives. 
He is currently working on an exciting book project on Final Fantasy and gender that dissects and critically analyzes representations of gender in all of the mainline Final Fantasy titles. He has also worked with various organizations to host video games, video game related events to raise awareness of various causes, including mental health, social isolation, and personal disenfranchisement. His talk today is titled Ludo Literary Pedagogy, Play, Theory, and Inclusive Curriculum Design. I did want to say um, a really quick note, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this keynote. So if during the course of the keynote you have questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom call. Um, we'll be moderating the Q&A and we'll be getting to those questions at the end of the keynote. So without further ado, Dr. Quijano, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for that uh, amazing introduction, Gabby. I don't know how I'm going to live up to that, but hopefully I will. Let me go ahead and share the screen and uh, start by mentioning that in this last year, I've attended a large number, an insanely large number of online conferences. Uh, in, and I think I've pretty much got the keynote genre down. I am supposed to start uh, by asking if you all can hear me. So can you hear me? Uh, and then I'm supposed to talk uh, about the topic while reading from a manuscript, but to quote that uh, foremost philosopher of our age, Rhett Guy from Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, that sounds really boring. So instead, I'm going to use this PowerPoint to express myself. Uh, as we move forward, uh, remember to use the hashtag NTXGaming uh, because my hashtag pound sign was kind of turned down. Uh, but first, a little bit about myself. Gabby already talked about my education credentials and all that stuff. So instead, I'd like to tell you a story about how I ended up where I am today. I actually uh, grew up in poverty in Puerto Rico. Most of the people that I went to uh, high school with uh, ended up in, uh, in places where they're not so well off. Uh, and one thing that differentiated me from them was video games. I've always been into games like Final Fantasy, Lunar, and so on. And that gave me a kind of a head start in communication, reading, literacy from a very early age. So I've always been a proponent of games and education. And so I was ecstatic uh, when Gabby and Jason reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to talk about uh, games and pedagogy? So absolutely. Uh, like the Dean said earlier, uh, here we have a diverse uh, attendance uh, list. We have faculty, we have students, we have people from the community. Uh, so I feel that going really deep into kind of hard research would not be uh, a good service. It would rather be a disservice. So instead I'm going to do an overview of gaming and pedagogy. We'll talk a little bit about gamification versus game-based learning versus uh, how to actually integrate games into the curriculum. Uh, we'll talk about how to gamify our instruction, um, how to integrate games into the teaching and learning process. And we'll look a little bit uh, into curriculum in the context of game studies, uh, you know, something that TCU is uh, very well known for. And then we'll have a bit of a games showcase if we have time towards the end. Uh, but before that, though, um, I want to go back to the beginnings of what's arguably the modern age of game studies. Uh, it goes back to the publication of Hamlet on the Holodeck and Espen Arset's Cybertext back in 1997. Uh, and uh, Janet Murray in Hamlet on the Holodeck, she argued that games are at their core a narrative experience that lead to a kind of cyber drama that they are a participatory uh, story building experience, if you will. And on the other hand, Arseth argued that games are about design and rules, that they are systems of rules. And that kind of led to a debate uh, in the field of game studies where uh, in that uh, now famous or infamous uh, entry game studies years, year one uh, in the publication game studies, Arseth argued we need a discipline for ourselves that exists outside of the, and to use this language, outside of the colonial approaches of English literature, theory, etc. Um, and it was a kind of back and forth. You had uh, Janet Lynn, uh, who wrote a book on game setting and narrative. You had a visual, a visual perspective uh, being presented as well. 
Um, and we had that really awesome essay about Halo and the anatomy of the FPS that somehow found its way to the game studies that uh, it's essentially Halo is awesome, which it totally is, and I just thought it warranted uh, mentioning. But while that was happening uh, in the game studies debate, at the same time, you had a similar conversation going on in the field of education that led to kind of like the modern era of games and learning. And that finds its origins arguably with uh, James Paul Gee's 2003 work, uh, What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. And in that book, he argued that education as we know it is broken, uh, that we rely too heavily on what we know as the banking model, where the instructor just kind of stands at the front of the class and speaks at the students and students maybe take notes or maybe dose off and not pay attention. And uh, Gee's argument is that if we look at games and we look at the principles that they implement in their design, and then we use those same principles to design our curriculum, we will be able to use a more engaging, more inclusive model in teaching and learning. And he had 36 principles. Uh, there is a more thorough uh, document here, which I will share it, uh, in the chat. We don't have the chat, but I'll make sure that you'll get a link to this document. Um, and out of those 36 principles, some of the more interesting ones that I found were the design principle, in which he argues players become deeply familiar with the text's design not necessarily through explicit prompts on screen, but rather by engaging with the game itself. I don't know how many of you in the audience are familiar with that uh, very famous Ego Raptor video where he dissects uh, the first level of Mega Man X, uh, in which he demonstrates that the player begins facing right on the screen, so that prompts us to move right. And then as the player uh, begins encountering enemies that prompts us to push certain buttons. One makes the character jump, the other one makes the character shoot lemons. Um, and that challenges are introduced at a uh, kind of well-paced rate uh, at, and that allows the player to become familiar with the game. So the argument goes that in instruction we should use those same principles, what we now call the I plus one principle, where you meet the learner at the stage where they're at and then introduce challenges that feel challenging but not overwhelming. Uh, Guy also pointed out the uh, commit, committed learning principle in which players commit to continually learn. Uh, any good video game uh, will never stop challenging the player. New challenges will increase in difficulty but they will not be so overwhelming as to the point where they cannot be overcome. And so when we tailor our instruction that's the same principle that we need to adhere to. We need to focus on challenges that take our students one, two, or three steps beyond where they are, but not make them feel overburdened with the content that they're giving them. Um, we use the ongoing learning principle in which games uh, consistently push players to learn. Um, and this is different from the commitment principle in that the commitment principle is more of a focus on the player slash student, whereas the ongoing learning principle is more focused on the way that the game is designed or in the way that we design our curriculum uh, and how those designs actually um, encourage students or players to move forward. And then of course the multimodal principle, we all know that games are inherently a multimodal medium. We have visual, audio, we have interactive and narrative components. And so instruction should also be that way. We shouldn't just focus on a lecture. Instead, we should also include written materials, visuals uh, when needed, and if we can make a kind of game-based instruction, then uh, that would be even better. And so after Guy said that, a bunch of educational researchers said, that's really cool. How can we integrate video games into the classroom? So you had Kurt Squire, the likes of Ian Bogos, Mark Pransky, all writing either research articles or manuscripts saying, hey, these are games that we can use in the classroom. I myself looked at 
uh, how video games could be used in the ESL, English as Second Language Acquisition process. Um, and this was sort of a, a burgeoning age of research into the integration of games in the classroom. We had uh, Leonard Anetta, for example, with uh, video games in education, why they should be used and how they are being used, which takes a look at how instructors were using video games uh, around the mid 2000s. Uh, and he wrote this manuscript that's essentially a best practices. Uh, we have fields in biology, uh, marketing, etc., looking at video games that simulation as a learning tool. Uh, but Guy came out afterwards in 2005 and said, no, no, wait, that's not what I mean. When I say game-like enterprise, I don't mean that we have to have people learn biology or any so such thing from an actual game, though there's nothing wrong with that idea. What I mean is that we should have learners engaged in actions and activities that share features with good video games. Essentially, uh, he kind of doubled down on the whole, I'm not saying put video games in the classroom. Instead, let's gamify education, right? Let's make education game-like. And a couple of years after, in 2008, uh, he wrote a second book looking at design principles that could be implemented in video games. Uh, specifically, he focused on the interaction principle in which communication uh, occurs between players and the game. And so the way that we take that into curriculum design is that we make sure that uh, the student is continually engaged with the content. Every so often, we should stop and ask questions. Uh, we should engage in active discussion. We shouldn't just stand up here and lecture. Agency, letting players uh, have control over the environment. And in curriculum design, that could take the form of allowing students uh, to engage in uh, the structure of the syllabus, in letting them have control over the kind of units uh, or maybe readings that are going to be covered, uh, not forcing them to do things in a pre-planned way. Um, essentially giving them a sort of open world syllabus, if you will. Um, and one way that I do this is by giving students a lot of options that they can pick and choose from and they get a certain amount of points by completing uh, short write-ups. Uh, they get more points if they do the major assignments and it's structured in such a way that students do have to meet the word limit instituted by the Texas State Education Board. Uh, but they also have a fun time both figuring out what they want to do and writing those papers. Um, and then, of course, the pleasantly frustrating principle in which uh, translates into the I plus one. Um, and there are some further readings that I'd like to share with you, so I'll send those links to uh, James, and then he can forward them to all of you later. Now. While Guy was saying, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Just let's look at games and figure out how we can enhance curriculum. Uh, researchers, scholars, etc., uh, were talking about what role do games have in training and coming up with uh, simulations to allow, for example, doctors to practice surgeries before going into actual surgeries. Uh, we started thinking about how can games be used in classroom and devising strategies to, for example, allow students to do book reports on Final Fantasy, character analyses on the Tales of Symphonia games, etc. We started considering what effects do games have on the learner? Does it encourage them uh, to learn and practice the course content if they are exposed to it through a game? And there's a really interesting theory that arises from this called tangential learning, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, do games change the mechanics of teaching and learning? That's another big question that we still have an answer today. Uh, and we started exploring uh, gaming populations. So who are the digital natives, uh, broadly speaking, Gen C onwards, and maybe uh, some of the younger millennials? Uh, why are video games so engaging? And I don't, I don't know how many of us are familiar with the Skinner Box concept, the idea of performing an action, getting a reward, and then uh, that prompts our brain to release certain chemicals that make us feel elated and happy, right? So video games use these kinds of psychology and design principles uh, to keep the player engaged in the use of the game. Maybe we can use those as well in how we design 
curricula. And then, of course, a question of how we evaluate games for learning, which we'll look at in a little bit. Um, and building on the work of Mark Presky, uh, we have H.J. Uh, Brown's Video Games and Education. Uh, this volume is uh, incredibly interesting. It tackles games in a lot of educational contexts, including storytelling, aesthetics from a visual rhetoric perspective, uh, a comparison of games versus film and how video games were at first borrowing cinematic techniques from movies. Uh, and now we've kind of come around and we see movies borrowing techniques that were pioneered by video games. Uh, the book talks about politics and video games, and yes, video games are political. Uh, video games do raise uh, ethical issues, and sometimes they even tackle religion. Um, there are college courses dedicated to both the history of games and to looking at how games explore real-world history from a ludic perspective. Uh, that's also explored in this book. And by the way, no, I'm not getting any kind of kickbacks or, or whatever promotion. Um, it's just a really good book that does tackle a lot of these big questions in the field of games and education. And that brings us to tangential learning. The idea that by presenting a concept through a video game, uh, that the player will become inherently interested in that concept and try to do research and learn more about it. Uh, Chris Aviles defines it as uh, the process by which people self-educate around topics if it is exposed through them through something that they already enjoy. And some of you might be wondering, why did I put Sephiroth, that evil dude from Final Fantasy VII there, in that picture? Um, and it's because Daniel Floyd, uh, one of the big games and education uh, YouTubers at the time, right, a public scholar, if you will, he said that the concept of the Sephiroth was a perfect example of tangential learning in that... Um, Players will look at Sephiroth, do research on the origin of the names, uh, of Sephiroth's name, and then discover that it comes from kind of biblical mythology, uh, angelic hierarchies, and so on. That, however, I felt was kind of a weak example, and there are certainly better examples of tangential learning. Uh, the big one that comes to mind out of the uh, more recent games that I played, uh, you know, recent, quote-unquote, uh, are the SimCity games, in which if you play SimCity, as you play, you will learn a little bit about taxes and their effect on uh, a city's economy. You might learn about how workers try to unionize and how larger corporations try to do union busting and all these kinds of uh, governance and economic concepts. Now, what you'll learn from SimCity is by no means an in-depth exploration of governance or economy, but by the framework of tangential learning, it means that you, once you're done playing these games, you'll try to do research on your own time and uh, try to learn more about these things because you find them interesting and because you discover them through a video game. Uh, the same is true with Oregon T uh, Trail, a, a game that I'm sure everyone knows of that talks about uh, a historical situation, a historical context through a fictional story, uh, Never Alone, a game based on uh, Eskimo mythology, and then of course Papers, Please, a game that's all about the immigration process that might get players curious enough to start researching about the effects of immigration either on the state or on immigrants themselves. So that's the concept of tangential learning. But we also have the concept of gamification, another one that uh, arose around this time. Uh, the, team, the term was allegedly coined by Nick Pelling in 2002, uh, and it is the application of game-like uh, user interfaces in design uh, to make electronic transactions both enjoyable and fast. At least that's how Nick Pelling uh, described it in, in 2011. Now, I say that it was allegedly coined by him because I couldn't find an actual source for that 2002 uh, statement. 
I did find a blog post on 2011 where he says, hey, oh, that term gamification, that's now popular. I actually invented it back in the day. But the first recorded use of the word uh, actually goes back to a 2007 blog by uh, a guy named Brent Terrell. Uh, and it was certainly popularized by Jim McGonigal in, in 2011 with Reality is Broken, with her tech talk, and uh, with the uh, multiplayer thumb war exercise that, that she showed. So gamification uh, is the application of gamic elements on top of non-gaming uh, activities. For example, in the context of education, instead of telling students that they'll get the average of whatever tests they take, you make that a gamified event in which tests result in earning badges or in leveling up a student's character. And at the end, if the student perhaps uh, earns level 10, then they get a C in class. If they earn level 15, they get a B and so on. But there's also game-based learning, which is a lot more involved in gamification. It's about turning the whole experience into a game. Uh, and there are some differences, even though these two terms are used interchangeably. I, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the differences between them. Uh, namely, that game-based learning is a whole integrated instructional method, whereas gamification is more the application of game-like elements to non-gaming spaces, like we just mentioned. Uh, game-based learning focuses on integrating games into the course itself. If we're looking at uh, an education and teaching and learning situation, whereas gamification is things like achievements, badges, leaderboards, etc. Uh, game-based learning uh, includes the game as part of the content itself. It's not just a mechanic used to encourage engagement with the content. In other words, if we're teaching, for example, uh, biology, we could have a game about biology through which students learn uh, these concepts, and that would be game-based learning, whereas gamification would be something along the lines of uh, you get an achievement for completing a certain number of labs and these achievements you can use to level up your character's level and eventually you get an A based on the character's level. Uh, and in game-based learning, uh, it's implemented largely in educational context, some corporate settings and some training, uh, whereas gamification it has a more broader appeal, perhaps because it's a little bit uh, easier to engage with. So if you want to use game-based learning, you actually need to start by gamifying your course. And you need to do this from the get-go, meaning that when you, and especially for instructors, when you are building your syllabus, you might want to start adding gaming concepts to it. Uh, so instead of thinking of averages, here in the section, uh, on the right side, for example, think in terms of experience points. In this case here in this syllabus that I uh, used last summer, um, students who earn certain points will earn grades. Now you will see that there is a sort of correlation between the points that we have here and grades as we traditionally know them in percentage wise, right? So when students hit 600 points, they get a D. When they hit 700 points, they get a C and so on. But if you look at the total amount of possible points, it's actually 1,200 points. So students have some leeway to play around with and explore both the course content and the assignments. And it might be that for a student to get an A, uh, if they're a little bit shy, they don't like participating in class, they prefer to sit down for long periods of time and just hunker down and write long papers, then they'll want to do all five major assignments for a total of 600 points and that get the other 300 points through short assignments, reflections, and so on. But it might be that a different type of student would rather focus on the shorter assignments first and then use the longer papers to get to that A. It might be that you have a student who uh, is not that good of a writer, so they focus instead on process revisions, etc. And maybe that student will never get a perfect score on any of the assignments, but they still have the opportunity of earning an A, even if it's just barely, because they decided to be completionists. 
uh, if a student wants to complete all of the assignments, they are welcome to do so. Right. So this would be how you start uh, implementing game-based learning in your course by gamifying assessment. And then as you move forward, you take activities like content reviews and you turn those into play sessions. Uh, this, for example, is a model that I came up with for fostering debate. I might divide my students into four, five, six sections. Um, and I usually use these when we're dis, uh, discussing uh, rhetorical appeals. I will ask uh, the students from group number one, for example, what do you think is the most persuasive rhetorical appeal for appealing to a person's logos, right? For uh, appealing to logic. And they'll say something like uh, physical evidence. And then I'll ask the students from group number two, do you agree? If they agree, we move on to group number three, do you agree? And so on, until someone will inevitably disagree. They'll say, well, I think it's common sense. Now we have a debate. The two student groups will have a minute prep time. They'll present their case to the other students and students will vote. So we'll have a bit of an IQ squared like debate and whoever wins gets a series of points. Now these points can be predetermined or they can be based on student performance, but either way, you as the instructor working on the back end need to have some sort of a way to measure this, right? So at this point, we are presenting essentially a, a new UI to, in, to instruction, a new user interface, right? And so after we're done with this activity, by the end, students will be ranked. So there's a concept of leaderboard uh, in terms of which group was the most persuasive versus which group wasn't. And then we can have a conversation about what is actually the most effective way to persuade someone, right? And then you can modify this activity for psychology, for game studies, etc. right? So what did a writer mean when they said whatever in literature? Or you could add game-based abilities with house rules, like for example, we're all familiar with Jenga. You pull a block, put it on the top, and then at some point someone's going to topple the whole tower. So what you could do is either write on the Jenga blocks a question, students will pull it. If they answer the question correctly, they put it on top. If they answer it incorrectly, then they have to pull another block and so on until they answer correctly. Or another version of this kind of gamified Jenga is one where you could divide students into groups, ask a group a question, and if they answer correctly, then other groups pull blocks. But if they answer incorrectly, students in that group pulls a block. Um, and then whoever topples their tower first loses, whoever stays till the end wins. And then you can uh, allocate points so that students level up their experience meter accordingly. Right? So these are just two of the things that I do uh, to kind of gamify and implement game-based learning in my courses, which brings us to game studies as a field. This is what I'm sure a lot of you um, are more interested about. But first we need to ask what version of game studies? Are we talking about the version of game studies that focuses on the structure of the game or the version of game studies where we debate what's a game? Are we looking at a game studies where we look at the player or at the narrative structure or even at the industry itself. And so what I would advocate for is that we use a holistic approach to the study of games. First, we need to look at them as reconfigurable texts. Uh, there is certainly a lot of discussion about what is or isn't a game, but I think it's a more interesting framework if we look at them as things that we could read, and I'm, I use that term very broadly on purpose, that we could read in different ways. They are texts that are definitely ludic. They always involve some kind of play uh, and an input-output feedback. Uh, so there is that engagement that he and others, uh, you know, going all the way back to Huizenga, uh, say that should exist uh, in games. Uh, and a lot of them are narrative. 
not all of them are. I'm not so sure that you could make the argument, at least not a coherent one, uh, that Tetris, for example, has some sort of a narrative, uh, even though some have tried. Uh, but there are certainly visual that's in their name, video games, right? So that video would be the visual component. They are oral. Uh, so a lot of them have uh, music design implemented very purposefully. For example, Persona 5 is it's a game that uses a soundtrack that's, uh, you know, very purposeful. And these are all things that we need to consider. There is no need for division. Uh, in game studies, there's no need to say that, you know, games are this or games are that. Why not both, right? Or rather, how, why not all of them? Uh, games are all of these things, and they are rhetorical in nature, and they are critical and political, and they look at society and discuss thematically relevant things. Um, like, for example, Watch Dogs. I remember reading a lot uh, when it first came out, the very first one, about how it was just a power fantasy and this kind of dark hacker fantasy story and yes that's true but it also came out during a time when a lot of people were concerned about privacy and hacking and if we look at the way that Watch Dogs encourages players to behave where it gives the player achievements for hacking um, is Watch Dogs making an argument for surveillance or is it making an argument against surveillance because ultimately what Aiden is trying to do is kind of bring down this nefarious network of evil people who are trying to do away with your data? Um, or is it an argument about the way that cybersecurity itself is structured? These are all things that we can think about. Um, and that's just from Watch Dogs, a game that's not specially deep. Um, but we do need to acknowledge that the author is dead, going back to Roland Barthes. In the sense that once you get a game, you as a player can interpret it however you want. You can interpret it as, for example, Janet Murray did with Twitter as a kind of uh, visual allegory of the Berlin Wall coming, you know, being knocked down and of the kind of New York lifestyle being hurried. Or uh, you could read it as James Paul Key did as. Uh, a visual metaphor for sex in which he argues in his book video games are good for your soul uh, that some of the blocks represent sexual organs and then when they connect it means that a sexual advance has been successful or hasn't been successful um, and personally I would say that these interpretations are not entirely accurate to me but here's the thing, the author is dead and the game can mean different things to different people. So however you want to read your game, what's important is that you make those arguments, right? So you want to take that approach to game studies where you look at the game's structure, absolutely important. What are the rules of play? What's the narrative? How do the visuals and the sound work together or against each other uh, to create an, exper an experience? Uh, you know, an example of these two things working together, games and visual, uh, would be Skyrim where the game narratively tells you that there is a lot of urgency, you are the chosen one, you need to destroy the evil god, but then play-wise it gives you an open world that's majestic and then you end up spending 300 hours looking for flowers so that you can give them to the pharmacy guy and he can make a potion, right? So it's definitely all of these things, but once you're done looking at the game, there's no reason to not look at the player. So also consider the player. Who are they? Who plays games? The answer being everyone. Uh, even people who don't concern, don't consider themselves as gamers have Candy Crush on their phone, have played Farmville on Facebook, right? So uh, my wife has actually spent more on Candy Crush than I have in my entire game collection, which uh, it's a thing. Uh, you know, what are the player types? Are the players uh, the type that will impulsively purchase or engage with a game uh, for long play sessions? Or is it a player who sits down, plays for a couple of minutes, calls it a day? Uh, we could look at player psychology and the effects that games have on the way that players perceive 
uh, their reality. We could look at gamer communities and do deep dives into uh, r slash gaming or r slash PC master race. I think it's one of them. We could look at how indie versus AAA studios work. And heck, we could even ask the question of what is an indie studio anyway? Uh, there are studios, for example, that consider themselves indie, but they have uh, 100 people working on games. Uh, you have, uh, for example, uh, this studio uh, that made Life is Strange. The name escapes me, but it's a subsidiary of Square, and yet the studio itself is indie. So how does that work? Those are interesting questions that you might want to consider in the gaming ecosystem. Uh, you might want to look at esports, how they work, uh, maybe esports economy or the streaming economy or marketing. And these are all things that exist within game studies. So the, the ultimate argument is that there's no need for separation in game studies. Uh, you can look at all of them uh, holistically, um, you know, and so on and so on, to quote Zizek. Uh, so what games should we talk about in the classroom? And the answer is, it really depends. The first thing you'll want to consider as an instructor is what do you want to explore? Uh, I'm someone who, when I started talking about games in the classroom, I just went to the games that I loved the most. And I had a list full of Final Fantasies, Lunars, Shining Force, Fantasy Stars. And if you're seeing a trend here, they're all role-playing games and they're all narrative, uh, turn-based, and they're kind of the same experience ultimately. It's the story that I wanted to tackle. Why? Because at the time, I was an ESL instructor and I wanted my students to be engaged with the written language, specifically with English. Right? But maybe some of you might be interested in exploring game mechanics. And if so, you'll want a really diverse uh, list of games that has mechanics that play differently. You'll want a side scroller, you'll want role playing games, you'll want uh, indie games that are open world, you'll want sandboxes, you'll want to highlight all the differences between all of these genres. And then consider if the game is well suited to your topic. Uh, there are certain games that, for example, are narrative, but to the handle topics that, uh, let's say, would not be appropriate, or rather handle topics in an inappropriate way to be presented to, for example, kids in junior high school. Um, you'll want to consider if the game is engaging, which has two different contexts in which this question can be answered. If we want to use games for the purposes of teaching some other content that's not inherently gamic, like for example, languages and history and so on, you want that game to be engaging. But if you're teaching game studies, does it really matter if the game is engaging or not for when you show it in class? I don't think so, because what you're looking at is how to make engaging games or what makes a game engaging. And so in that context, it would be invaluable to have a game that's really boring, repetitive, and so on. Um, you'll want to consider what's the game's underlying message, if there is one, uh, what does the game teach, or even if it teaches anything. And most importantly, do you want your students to play? This is a really interesting question. I have seen cases in which game studies professors just show gameplay of the game. I remember reading a blog, I can't remember who wrote it, but I'm leaning toward it being Jesper Jewell. Uh, who said that some of his acquaintances uh, invited him to play Madden and then made fun of him because he was no good at Madden, right? So um, how much do you play a game and do you really need to be an expert in the game to teach it or do you just need to be uh, deeply familiar with how the mechanics work? I always lean towards that second one. I don't think you need to pull off that uh, Evo Moment 37 Daigo Perry in order for you to talk about Street Fighter as, for example, an object that represents cultures in a certain way, right? And at this point, we would be at the Games Showcase, but I would like to say, you know, F in the chat to pay respects for Flash games. When I was building a list of games that I wanted to talk about here, I found that a lot of them no longer worked because Flash stopped being supported at the end of last year. Um, it, it was a painful realization. A lot of these games did come around again in, for example, Steam versions or um, mobile versions for the phone, uh, but now you have to pay money for them, whereas previously they were free, for example. That one that we see here in the top right 
uh, don't ask any questions, follow me, I think it's the same. Um, you know, it used to be free, now you have to pay, I think, like a dollar for it. But an interesting one to consider is Play Gink, a game that I think is especially relevant to the times that we have today. Uh, in this game, you become a pathogen, a virus, and your role is to infect everyone in a pandemic, make sure that everyone dies. Uh, interestingly, when uh, Corona first hit, uh, this game started seeing a lot of downloads um, and they actually had to put out a release saying, this game is just simulation. What happens in the game is not necessarily what's gonna happen with Corona. Don't take it as the end all be all authority, right? It's a game that was designed uh, pre-pandemic uh, in order for you to create a pandemic and then people started using it like as a point of reference, which is an interesting thing, but uh, Should it be? Maybe Especially if you contrast that to other games that are more recent like for example COVID the outbreak um, Which is a game in which you take the role of the CDC. You're trying to actually prevent the outbreak now notice how the shift in perspective here uh, leads to a different rhetorical message in one of them uh, you are being presented the plague as a cool thing something that you literally aspire to be because you take the role of the pathogen whereas in the other one in COVID the outbreak uh, the pathogen is framed as something undesirable um, now these games that you see here are all from a folder that I have called literary gaming there are games that I've used at some point or another uh, in my courses uh, when I uh, teach, for example, a journalism and censorship uh, lesson. Uh, I go to the Westport Independent. I have students play uh, the game, which is uh, a game in which the player takes a role of an editor and they have to either censor or publish news that are favorable to the state. Because if you don't, the state will kill your family, right? So it, it's a lot of kind of censorship heavy vibe that you as a player gets. Uh, we have Elegy for a Dead World. It's a game with visual designs inspired by the romantic poets, Keats, Shelley, Byron, Blake, etc. Uh, and your role as you navigate these worlds is to populate them with poetry and language. And this is something that I use in all of my writing courses. Uh, there's to be or not to be an interesting, funny kind of twist on Shakespeare's work. You have Kind Works, uh, Kind Words, which is a really good game if you want to have your st your students explore uh, kind of being in a safe mental health space, uh, headspace, uh, help them develop good mental health habits and so on. Uh, it's a game where you air your grievances anonymously and strangers reply to you with encouraging words. Um, and so on, right? So all of these are games that are kind of literary in nature. They have uh, some kind of a ludo educational component, uh, which could be tangential, as is a case, the case with, for example, a plague tale, or in other cases where they explicitly teach you about things. Um, and so at this point, I would like to address any questions or comments. Uh, do we have any? You have about eight minutes for questions. I'm, I'm sorry that I went a little bit over. Ah, oh, Johan, you're good. It was great. Uh, first off, thanks so much. This is the point where we all pause for applause, and because it's a webinar, there's... Yay! If, Yay. if, if I clap, it'll just sound weird. But imagine all 27 attendees are standing up right now, uh, wherever they are, and cheering wildly, because that was really great. Uh, awesome. thanks. thanks so much. Uh, yeah, we've got some questions uh, lined up. And uh, we uh, even got a few from the Discord and other places, so we'll be kind of collecting them. Uh, Gabby, can you jump in with uh, our first question? Yeah, for sure. And thank you, Johan. That was wonderful, and I really enjoyed it. Um, our first question, which is an interesting one from Scott Warren about the types of games that are taught in the mm -hmm. um, Scott asks, given that most games used by teachers today are commercial, mm -hmm. but the vendors do not reveal their design and pedagogy, how do we ensure educators can choose games that will not harm students educationally or emotionally? I think that's a tricky question. It depends on where you are as an instructor. Uh, like you mentioned, the vendors don't uh, often share their pedagogy or design philosophy or anything along those lines. And a lot of times instructors are at the mercy of the 
uh, director, if it's a K-12 school or their deans, uh, sometimes we just have no choice. The institution will say, here, teach this. And then we just kind of have to, right? Our hands are tied. Um, in those cases, we just need to make the best out of it. We need to become uh, deeply familiar with uh, the game and kind of guide our students through uh, the experience and kind of minimize any harm that might have been uh, unwittingly included in the design. Uh, but if you do have the freedom to choose what games uh, to address, then that takes us back to uh, the slide which we have a couple back here on evaluating uh, games for class. You need to uh, first do a deep analysis of the rules of play and consider what's the theme being presented on top of the game, right? What's the perspective being presented? Um, there are certainly games that we might want to stay away from in most cases. Uh, for example, Grand Theft Auto is not a game that I would teach, but I haven't taught a formal game studies course in a while. In a formal game studies course, I would definitely use Grand Theft Auto to explore narrative, uh, game mechanics, uh, how players interact with the game world. Um, there's this really interesting video where they have, for example, um, the, the show's called Elders React. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Uh, they have a bunch of people who are like 60, 70, 80, start playing Grand Theft Auto. And a lot of them start with, oh, how pretty. It's a house. I'm going to walk around and try to do coffee. And if I go out, can I hop in the car? And you see people driving very slowly and obeying traffic rules um, until they figure out, hey, it's GTA. You're supposed to go around killing people. And then suddenly they're like, yes, I killed a person, right? So... Um, you as an instructor would need to ask yourself, is this the kind of experience that I want my students to have? Um, and essentially do uh, kind of play testing with the game. Maybe have someone, an acquaintance, play through the game and kind of observe their reactions um, and so on. Uh, does that address the question? I think so. All right, cool. Um, we'll, we'll see if Scott follows up. All right. uh, if, if he if he uh, wants some more there, uh, one very quick question and then into kind of a, a fuller question. One anonymous question from the chat was, um, would you be willing to share these slides afterwards? We're going to send an email out to all uh, yep. of the attendees. So if you're up for that, cool. Yeah, we'll absolutely. Just, I'll, I'll send them to you and then you can forward it to everyone. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, okay, now on to the, the fuller, longer question. Oh, and I should report the Discord was absolutely going nuts after uh, your presentation with applause and things like that. I, cool. I just was over here and, and missed it. So, yes. Um, so question from, uh, Steven Manderberg. I'm curious about your discussion of tangential learning mm -hmm. in particular, you cite never alone, but that seems very much about the cultural videos throughout. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're differentiating Seth Roth, general idea of knowledge, biblical stuff, and some form of skill linked knowledge, how cities, taxes, and immigration work. Mm -hmm. Could you explain this good, bad example situation? Uh, so um, I'm not so sure that they that they are good or bad in the process of uh, learning, right? The, the the concept of tangential learning is that the player will become exposed to a concept and then uh, continue doing research. And in the case of Never Alone, it is absolutely about the uh, you know the culture of the tribes. Uh, but tangential learning is a process that happens on the player's side. It's something that as designers or instructors, we can hope it sticks, if you will, but it's ultimately up to the student. It's, it's something that happens more for the intrinsic reward of learning about all the cool stuff that's represented in the game. Uh, so in the case of Never Alone, for example, I'm someone who thought the game was really interesting. I did um, a bit more reading. I looked up uh, that very reliable source, Wikipedia, that we all know and love, um, and did a bit more reading about the tribes, their histories, um, and so on. Uh, in the context of uh, games like SimCity, um, the learning happens as you play, so there's a bit of game-based learning there as well. Uh, to the point where, and I don't think I'm the only one with this experience, uh, I gave it to my kid when he was eight. He started playing, and a couple of days after, he started talking to me about taxes. Um, I had forgotten that I gave him SimCity. I'm like, well, how do you know about taxes? And he's like, well, in the game you gave me the other day. Um, you know, so that's uh, the kind of learning that's tangential, meaning that you become exposed to a concept, 
and then you want to learn more about it. Uh, so I'm not so sure that there is necessarily a good or bad thing uh, in the process itself. Now, there can be a negative outcome in that maybe you look at Grand Theft Auto and you go like, hmm, I wonder what Grand Theft Auto stands for. And then you start doing research and you end up in the kind of darker sections of the Internet. And suddenly you use Bitcoin to buy a gun because you want to go and shoot someone in the real life. But um, I'm, I'm going to say that's happened maybe twice. And I'm not even sure that that's the case. Right. Um, if we actually became interested in things about, about video games and suddenly master those skills, I'm sure that a lot of us would be rock stars because of playing Guitar Hero, right? So, um, yeah, so I guess that's my answer. But if you have a follow-up, you're more than welcome to, you know, throw it in the chat. Awesome. Thanks for that, Johan. We have a follow-up question from Scott um, who says he's also interested in games that teach personal stories like Edith Finch and Gris. Mm -hmm. Do all games that teach need to be related to critical theory slash power questions? Um, I, I don't think that all the games need to be designed in that way, uh, but a lot of the, a lot of games can be interpreted in that way. Um, an example of a game that I don't think it's necessarily related to power questions, like to, to stick in the indie space, Super Meat Boy. Um, that's as basic as it gets. You know, your meat girlfriend was kidnapped, and now you need to rush through all of these really hard kind of puzzle platform spaces. To rescue her and uh, you know the game can be seen as a kind of commentary on previous games of that genre which ultimately i think most games are a commentary on on the genre that they uh, embody uh, but absolutely not not all games need to you know be a critical commentary on society or politics or whatever um, again it all depends on the topics that you as an instructor want to explore uh, but you also need to remember that, again, the author is dead and uh, probably so are you as an instructor, right? I, I tell my students uh, one of the games that I like, I like to use when I'm talking about rhetoric and systems is Every Day the Same Dream. Uh, this is a game that uh, I'll try to look up some pictures here. It doesn't work anymore because of Flash. Um, but it's a game where you take control of this bland, boring looking dude every day, the same dream, and you go to work. And then you wake up and you do it again. Here we go. Here we have a couple of screenshots. Hopefully you can see it there. Uh, so you control this guy, you wake up, you go to work, and you wake up and go to work, and there's a scene in an elevator where this lady will tell you that you need to take five more steps towards freedom. And if all that you do is wake up and go to work, every day you will need to take those five steps. But at some point, you decide, you know what, this is boring, I'm going to do something else. I'm just going to go naked to work. And then you get fired because you have no tie on. That's a line from the game, right? So you get fired and now you have four steps to take to freedom. Maybe at some point you decide, you know what? I'm going to be a little bit late and stop and smell the roses or contemplate a leaf. Or walk the other way and find this homeless guy who takes me to a cemetery. And with each of these actions where you try to, quote unquote, break the system, you are one step closer to freedom. And then towards the end... Um, you have to kill yourself. You have to jump off the roof in order to finish the game. Now, the way that I read this game, going back to uh, you know the question uh, and the instructor being dead, the way that I often read this game is that our systems, the systems that govern us, um, you know, capitalism, democracy, the nine to five, and all that kind of stuff, is inherently oppressing. We are consistently trying to escape these systems, but whenever we find some kind of a clever way to buck the system, it reconfigures itself and becomes even more oppressive. And in the game, we see this because after you get out of your car and you pet the cow, if you try to do that again, the cow's not there. You try to go to the cemetery for a second time, and the guy who takes you to the cemetery is not there, and so on. And ultimately, what's the only way to escape the system? You have to kill yourself, and that's a really glum interpretation. But I remember the maybe eighth or ninth time that I uh, was talking about this game in one of my courses. Uh, the VP of the college came in, and he's like, let's, let's, let's see what the game's about. 
um, he sat down and I said, hey, Scott, would you like to, you know, share your thoughts on the game? He said, well, you know what? That one guy at the end was kind of depressing. I don't know why he killed himself. But to me, uh, the game is about how great capitalism is. Because uh, even though you have to go to work every day, you still have the freedom to do these things and get off and pet the cow and whatever. And he actually interpreted each of the run-throughs of the game as it being different people. Whereas I saw the character as just the same guy, right? So uh, we can absolutely have games that we think have or lack a meaning. Um, and then students will find a way to interpret it in another way. An example of a game that doesn't have a meaning, you know, going back to Tetris, you drop blocks. Uh, I've seen readings about dropping blocks where they are a metaphor for the Berlin Wall, a metaphor for sex, and a metaphor for a royal court where somehow peasants are bowing at the king and then the L-shaped uh, block represents the peasant and then the long block that you usually used to do a Tetris, that represents the king and, and so on, right? So um, it can be tricky dealing with different interpretations of games just like it can be tricky uh, dealing with different interpretations of, for example, literature, where spots of time can be about uh, memory, or if you're an eight-year-old, it could be a trampoline. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question was asked, I think, two or three different times uh, across different places. So I'm going to read you uh, Lee Zickel's question and then kind of expand on it with what I saw happening in the Discord around uh, the same question. Um, so in considering the idea that a core idea for playing games is that the player agrees to play, mm -hmm. when designing a game-based class, in what way do you deal with that opt-in idea? Is it simply if you agree to be in this class, then you're agreeing to play? Uh, so what about students who don't enjoy anything game-like? And then to expand on that from the Discord, th this was kind of a, a key thing that games let you opt in. Mm -hmm. And syllabi don't really let you opt in. Like you kind of do because you sign up for the class. Mm -hmm. but maybe it's required for your major, maybe there's just fewer options, and you can't change midway through the semester when you realize you're not liking it, like you could just, you know, eject the game and move on uh, in the same way. Uh, yeah, that, that's absolutely true. It's one of the big questions with uh, curriculum design. Um, in my case, whenever I teach a, a game-related course, uh, I tell the admins to explicitly advertise it as such. Uh, I give my students the option of transferring during the first week to another instructor, um, you know, I, I, I front load the information that we are going to be writing about games. So if you really hate games, uh, you know, I would recommend that you transfer. Uh, but absolutely, the, the premise of the games is that they need to be opt-in. Uh, but my assumption as an instructor, because our options are so limited, um, is that if you are in a class that's focused on games, you want to play those games. What I do... Um, is that I give students as many options as possible. So, for example, I don't force them to play Assassin's Creed. If I'm talking about open world games, I just let them choose an open world game and I give them a list as examples of open world games. But they can also look outside of the list and then run it by me like, hey, is this an open world game? And then we'll have that conversation. Um, I was actually having a conversation about this uh, precisely this morning where this guy said, that the first open world game he played was Magic Carpet. Now, I'm not familiar with Magic Carpet at all. Um, I looked up some videos and it seems like an action game, but um, I know that he's played The Legend of Zelda for the NES, which is an open world game, right? There's a space you can go out adventuring. He's like, no, that's not an open world game, right? So if he would have been a student, we would have had that discussion for the open world section uh, of the unit. Um, and ultimately, I would have found out that to him, open world implies 3D. So that would have narrowed down the list of games that he could have uh, chosen from. Um, so uh, to answer the question, uh, if a student doesn't want to play a game in order to either discuss it or, uh, discuss it or write about it in a class context, um, it would be the same as a student simply saying, I don't want to do the work, right? Which um, to me, at least as an instructor, as someone who's trained in, uh, you know, assessment and evaluation, um, it, it's just not going to fly. But what you can do is give them the option of which games to tackle within the context or topic that you're trying to discuss. Quick follow up to that, uh, and then we'll move on to the other main questions. Uh, Steven Mandelberg asks, uh, how do you control students all opting out once they've reached the certain number of points? 
right, in the XP grade model. Oh, I don't. Do your classes get, get emptier at the end? Does that happen? No, that, that, that's the thing. I, I don't. I, I literally tell them, you know what, if you're happy with a C, get to 700 points and just tell me you're done, and that's it. That's part of a, a fully fleshed out kind of game-based design. Now, that yeah. being said, what's important as an instructor, if you're concerned with students just stopping to show up, is for you to pace your assignments evenly, right? So you tell the students, here are all the assignments, do whichever ones you want, get to 900 points or whatever. Um, and the way that I structure it is that you cannot earn the C until you're about three months into the course. And that once you have those 700 points, it's super easy to get to the B and the A if you just stick around for the last you know, two weeks or so. Um, in most cases, students do opt to not do the final exam or the final essay, um, but I, I don't think there's really any problem with that. If they've shown mastery of the course content, what I want them to do and all that stuff, um, you know, if, if, if they don't want to do the final paper, that's fine. You've demonstrated that you have learned. Um, so, so that's the way that I design my courses. Thank you for that. And also to stress what you said earlier, uh, not every uh, teacher gets these opportunities for that flexibility. Mm -hmm. But if you've got it, this is a great way to use it. So thank mm -hmm. you for saying that. All right, our next question um, comes from John Kyung Kim, who asked, Dr. Kihano, could you talk about how you could measure or assess the efficacy of ESL students' language acquisition when they engage with a game-based curriculum in comparison to a non-game-based one? And this was echoed by a lot of comments about language acquisition in Discord as well. Yeah, so, so that was actually my uh, master's thesis when I was looking at uh, linguistics and language acquisition. Um, I just did an A-B study, right? So I had half of my students at the time go through the standard curriculum and then for the other half uh, we replaced two units uh, one uh, that was a book report focusing on characters and all that stuff with Final Fantasy 10 uh, and another unit that focused on doing uh, an oral report about a game uh, with Lifeline. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that game Lifeline. It's an old PS2 game. You need to use your headsets and a microphone and then you tell the character, hey, run this way or that way. And you play the role of uh, an operator. You're in the space station. Aliens invaded and the only person to survive the initial attack were you and a journalist, a female journalist. Uh, so she grabs a gun, she goes like, hey, operator, where do I go? And you have to speak to them, like, you know, go to the left, turn around, go there, you know, grab the box. Um, and what I what I did in that instance was just give them a pre-post-test, uh, one for writing, one for verbal communication. Um, and in the students that I had at the time, it worked. Uh, the ones who played uh, the video games instead of going through the traditional curriculum, uh, they had a higher mastery of the language than the ones who didn't. Not to say that the ones who didn't play games did poorly, by, by you know, on the contrary, they did great. It's just that I saw a faster linguistic development on the students who did play the games and then talked about them in class. They were more enthusiastic. Um, and this is also confirmed by other research. The uh, big one that I remember is by a Chinese researcher called uh, Feng S. Din. I don't know what the S stands for. Um, but what he did was something similar, two groups, one going through the traditional curriculum, uh, and in the other one he implemented World of Warcraft. And he actually taught the class in World of Warcraft, and then he would take students on raid, and they had to coordinate with each other. This was when it was vanilla WoW. Um, and what he writes in his research is that the students who played uh, the game and did the class on the game, they were more enthusiastic about learning, and even though when they came to class, for the once a week kind of you know debrief even though at those moments they were kind of like bored like your, their traditional students when they were playing and actively communicating uh their communication skills were through the roof i clicked on the wrong thing I, i'm unmuted now Whew, got so <laughs> scared there for a second oh. Oh, I'm safe. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, excellent answer. Uh, and then uh, the next question is from Alatham. Uh, and I've kind of got some questions about it too. Like I kind of want to follow up because it's a really good one. Um, so Alatham asks, the tangential learning aspect interest me, interested me, particularly in the relationship to hacking, modding, and video games. There's several examples of players fixing games, such as games released for Steam that are unoptimized for the platform or revising games through randomizer runs and speed runs. Mm -hmm. Continuing with this thought, 
Can we include students in the development of the syllabus as they gain more agency and authority, or indeed the coursework of college curriculum? And and so now that's that's Alethane's question. And my part is just like, yes, I'm so excited about that. I have tried and failed to do that in so many ways. So particularly not just can we do this, but if you've got thoughts on how to, let me know because my ways are failing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you should absolutely include your students in that kind of development. But uh, very much like you, Jason, I have failed when I give students total freedom over, you know, the syllabus. I tell them, what do you want to do? And they just kind of stare at me like, what do you mean? What do I want to do? You're the expert. You figure it out. Uh, but when I present it to them as uh, kind of a game, if you will, as a puzzle, where I tell them, OK, here's unit one. Here are the learning outcomes. We can do three of these 10 things, let's have a vote. Uh, I found that's more engaging. It gives them certain degree of power uh, over their own learning um, and, and they just enjoy it. So yeah, absolutely. Let students participate in the building of the, the uh, syllabus, but uh, make sure to you know constrain them. Make, make it a sandbox. Um, to, to make mm -hmm. that to, to, right, to make that gaming metaphor, uh, give them Minecraft creative mode or Disney Infinity creative mode. Don't give them the Unity engine. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that story. I don't even know if it's true, but I, I was told this when I was a teacher in training that, uh, you know, the, the new principal comes to the, the elementary school and sees that all the kids are playing like right against the chain link fence mm -hmm. and says, this is, this is terrible. We want this free range school. Let's tear down the fence and let the kids just roam wild. And uh, the school board says, fine, we'll tear down the fence. They tear down the fence. And the next day, all the kids are just huddled against the wall of the school mm -hmm. and won't go even a few feet away. And I don't know how true that is, but it makes complete sense to me that unless it has some kind of structure, I can't play with it. I can't figure out what to do. Yeah. And so designing that structure is so important. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually one of uh, Guy's principles in his uh, first work, uh, What Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. Um, he talks about how we need to give students um, a safe space for them to practice and fail. Um, so it's not just about telling them, go learn whatever, right? If, if that worked, then right now with the advent of the internet, we would have everyone be the brightest possible person in humanity. But instead, we have all this information and we spend half of our day looking at cat videos on YouTube, right? Um, so certainly students do need that kind of structure, uh, but they do need to freedom to work within that structure. Are you, are you looking at the questions ahead of time? Because you just transitioned so well. I'm not. Oh my goodness. I was just gonna say that you it was the perfect transition so so scott warren asks are you aware of any learning games gamification examples that follow Guy's principles so maybe we could talk about that a little bit more but um absolutely and and the answer is uh all of them except cosmic race uh cosmic race is this terrible playstation one game uh, where you're supposed to race, but like the racetracks are transparent. So you have to kind of figure out where they are and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but Geese learning principles are actually based on his observations about games and how they function. So when he talks about uh, giving gamers uh, freedom within a structure, for example, uh, he draws that principle from Full Spectrum Warrior, a game that he uh, played and he thought, you know, this is kind of cool and, you know, I can be whatever role I want. I can be a combat medic, I can be the uh, soldier guy, I can be an engineer, but I am constrained, right? And I can master each of these roles individually or eventually if I play the game through enough times, I can master all of them, uh, but the game is telling me what to do, right? And so he came up with that kind of uh, structured space in which uh, students engage with the content, uh, right? So that's a principle that he drew from that game. Uh, the concept of giving uh, students clear prompts uh, for guided learning, I think this was principle four or five. Uh, it, it's the guided text principle, I believe. Uh, he got from playing Pajama Sum with his kid. That's kind of like a text adventure for children. Um, and if we look at uh, more modern games, uh, the one that I'm playing right now, Genshin Impact, uh, which uh, if you like to gamble, I don't recommend you play. Uh, it, it's kind of like a gacha game, but it does give you an open space. And in that open space, you can choose to follow the main story quest and, you know, kill the big dragon, which eventually you find out was originally good and his heart was corrupted and all that kind of stuff. 
or you can choose to just ignore the story and focus on leveling up your character. So the game gives you freedom uh, to explore, but you're not allowed to clip through walls. You're not allowed to go beyond the play space. Um, so there you have another embodiment of Guy's principles, right? So these are principles that come from games, and Guy argues we should implement them in the way that we create curriculum. But all games inherently have uh, at least you know five or six, based on what I've seen uh, of these principles that you've seen. Awesome. Uh, there's also some questions in Discord. Uh, pretty soon we're kind of going to shift from this over to uh, our break time before our next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but Johan, at some point, maybe you can look through the Discord and start to catch up as you are no longer the keynote and can, right. can just be a, a conference attendee and enjoy yourself and awesome. can answer those at your leisure. But you reminded me with the Genshin Impact thing, um, something I, I always love to do here, which is I want more game recommendations. So I'm going to I'm gonna just open myself real quickly and talk about a game that I'm playing recently that I like. Mm -hmm. uh, Johan, maybe you could do the same. Gabby, if you'd be willing to, you can do the same uh, since we're all here. And anybody in the Discord, throw it in, something you like. Mm -hmm. um, my wife loves Stardew Valley, and she got really into it during the pandemic um, and not, not a game player in general. And so I heard about this game called uh, Sakuna of Rice and Ruin. Um, and I got really excited about it, which is uh, platforming, JRPG, but also uh, rice planting um, simulator, where mm -hmm. they literally spent more time in development researching how to grow rice than they did on the platform mechanics. Um, so I've started this game. Uh, it's beautiful. I love the art. I love the characters. And the rice growing, Gabby's first question when I described it to her was, is it meticulous? And I said, it absolutely is. It's amazing. Rather than the, the crops of Stardew Valley where it's like plot, 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 it's giant dirt field. And wherever you put a, gra a, a rice uh, grain, that's where it grows, a rice sprout. You know, that, that's where it goes. It's completely free flowing. And controlling that and trying to get a straight line is part of it. Uh, moving, <laughs> my kids love watching me scoop out the outhouse to go make fertilizer. Like, it's just an adorable, beautiful, wonderful game. That sounds really fun. I'll definitely check it out. Um, Gabby, do you want to give your recommendation first, or should I? Oh, um, I don't know that I, I have anything super new to give. I'm, I'm having my students in my women's writing class right now play Never Alone, nice. and we're going to be playing Dysphoria next week, which usually goes, I've taught Dysphoria before, and it usually goes over really well. Um, so I would, I would recommend both of those. It's been interesting playing them in a women's lit class as opposed to playing them in a writing class mm -hmm. or in a game specific class. Um, and it's been, a, I think it's been a really positive experience so far. So I would recommend checking both of those out. Nice. Um, so, so I'm gonna break from the trend here a little bit. I feel like I've, I've, I've talked about, you know, games that lend themselves easily to discussion in class um, and just gush a little bit about the game that I use when I wanna relieve stress. I don't know how many of you are familiar with BPM, bullets per minute. It's this first-person shooter game, except that there's this kind of hardcore heavy metal beat. It's constantly going like boom, 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 boom. And then whenever the beat hits, that's when you can shoot. You cannot shoot otherwise. So you, you need to coordinate your mouse clicks with those beats. Otherwise, you're done. And that's kind of how I de-stress right now, which is like really important. We need to, uh, you know, keep our mental health, you know, going. So, you know, find a way to de-stress. And, you know, that's one of the things that I do. Bullets per minute. And then, of course, all the fighting games where you get to, you know, fight with like, Street Fighter, Tekken 7, etc. That sounds and, uh, so satisfying. One more question uh, from the, the panelist chat, the, the secret tech chat, where we're making sure that everybody's unmuted and things like that. Uh, John Kyung, a graduate student in our English department, who's been so kind to join us and help organize the Q&A and do these things, also asked his own question, which is, um, does an instructor need to focus on the process of students learning through the process of their playing or what they learned in the end? So I don't know, Johan, if that made sense the way I read it, but I think I got confused halfway through yeah. that sentence, but like the process of playing itself teaches versus the thing that it teaches. I, I don't yeah. know, I got confused again. Yeah, no, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, okay, I, I good, get the sense. question and uh, the answer is really, it depends on what you want to do as, as an instructor. Um, if you go back to, for example, teaching writing, uh, there are two schools of thought. You have the school of thought that says it's all about the writing process. Uh, it doesn't matter if you start by, uh, you know, writing something in a foreign language and then do Google Translate and then you go to the writing center 20 times and then, you know, it's it's all about what you learn versus you have the school of thought that's like it's all about the final product. 
Um, so you really first have to figure out what your own pedagogical uh, view is um, and then decide on one over the other. Uh, personally, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, so if I'm going to teach a game, for example, in a writing class, I want it to be something like LG for a Dead World, where students actively write, or like kind words, where they have to write letters to each other. And they're playing a game, they're also writing during the process, and that helps them in the context of the class whenever they have to turn in their big essay at the end of the month or whenever it's due. Um, unless, of course, it's maybe it's for something like a history class, like history and games. If you want to look at something like the mythology of Skyrim versus like Nordic mythology that inspired it. So that might be a little bit different. I'm not so sure that you can learn about actual Nordic mythology through playing Skyrim. Maybe you can. I just haven't seen the studies to it. Um, but certainly in that context, what would matter would be uh, the outcome. Does that answer the question? Right. Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much, Johan. I don't think we have any more questions at this point, but huge round of, of virtual applause for this wonderful keynote. I can't think of a better way to kick off and start the event. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for um, having me. Yeah, of course. Um, we did really, as Jason was saying, we're going to take a little bit of a break for people to grab lunch, sort of get situated. Um, we're going to be ending this call, but our event at 2 p.m., the Pedagogy Roundtable, which we're super excited for, you're gonna use the same link for that. Right. So it's the exact same link as the keynote. We're just gonna kind of shut this down. And Wait, then at 2 Before you do that, can I say one last thing? Um, yeah, a couple of sure. couple of resources on game and, lane and learning uh, that I use uh, is the books from ETC Press called Games, Learning, and Education. You can get them for free. So I'll send you the link to that so you can forward to everyone. Perfect. Fantastic. We really appreciate it. Um, and feel free, um, participants and panelists and attendees, everybody, the Discord is going to stay open. So if you have any questions or you just want to kind of touch base with people, please feel free to use the Discord until our next event at 2. Um, and thank you all so much for being here.